All right, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, depending on where you are, and uh, welcome to uh, today's session of uh, Soybean 360 Symposium. Uh, so we're glad that you were able to join us today, and uh, we have a lineup of uh, very fantastic uh, speakers uh, on a, a quite interesting area of uh, soybean protein research. So the title of today's symposium is uh, Innovations in Plant Protein Technology. Uh, so today we, we have um, uh, uh, a number of lectures. So I will start first of all by uh, introducing um, the, the session uh, and then that will be followed by a quick introduction of the speakers. And uh, so I, I believe you received the, the, uh, the schedule already. So after each lecture, I will have time for questions for each speaker. And uh, that will be followed by um, a panel discussion where all the speakers would come. Uh, so uh, in the process of the presentations, uh, uh, please, uh, we encourage you to submit your questions um, so that your questions will be read to the speakers at the end of each presentation. Uh, so the uh, emerging trends in research in the area of plant protein technology uh, is quite uh, advancing. Um, and um, so from today's lecture, uh, you get to see uh, a peek of uh, some of the cutting edge work uh, done at the interface uh, uh, between academic uh, industry research, as well as from a government research perspective in, in, uh, in plant protein technology. Uh, so without further ado, I would uh, start uh, with the introduction of the first uh, speaker. Uh, so for the first speaker we have, the title is uh, Protein and Starch in, uh, Interactions to Create Structure in Plant-Based Foods. And the speakers for today is that for the first lecture are Stacey Dobson and uh, Dr. Alejandro Marangoni. So Stacey Dobson, Dobson will be speaking uh, and I will quickly introduce her. Uh, so Stacey Dobson is an MSc student at the University of Guelph, Canada. And uh, she is supervised by Dr. Alejandro Marangoni uh, of the Food Health and Aging Laboratory at the University of Guelph. She is in the final stage of her master's uh, program, where she has been developing a novel process for the creation of a fibrous meat analog. Uh, the research has allowed her to investigate the functionality, structure, and interactions between various plant proteins and starches. Stacy has also uh, also has certificate as a professional culinary chef which has helped her further understand the food industry and create a product with desired taste and texture. Uh, so welcome at Stacey and uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Uh, today's talk is gonna be on uh, protein starch interactions to create structure in plant-based food. To start off, I'm gonna talk about a bit of the reasoning behind the research we're doing and what has pushed us to pursue this plant-based industry. Sorry, it's not letting me move forward. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so animal protein makes up a pretty large sector of the food industry. However, it's considered to be one of the most environmentally harmful and kind of unsustainable food sources. And with our growing population, it means we're gonna have uh, an increased demand for this kind of food. And with an increased demand, it means that all of the environmental factors that affect us right now are just gonna increase. So the greenhouse gases associated uh, with this industry which are direct contributors to global warming and environmental damage are just gonna get worse and worse. So we're needing to find a solution. And when we look even at some statistics, we see that the beef, lamb and goat in particular have some of the highest greenhouse gas emissions per gram of protein in this red region. And also the retail costs for these are incredibly high. And with the next following category, we have poultry and pork where we see um, also the next highest greenhouse gas emissions per gram of protein and also the, the relatively high costs. However, when we look into 
some uh, plant-based alternatives for protein, such as soy or beans, chickpeas, lentils, they have quite low impact um, on the environment. And also their price is incredibly low, meaning that if we can make products out of these, uh, out of these foods that would be less, more sustainable and ultimately cost less, then we could help save, start saving our planet and make more products that um, are sustainable. And when we look at uh, specifically here, replacing beef with plants in the U.S., we have a decrease of 90% across or in greater across croplands, greenhouse gases, nitrogen fertilizers that would all create this decrease and make it and make these products more sustainable. So there are products in the market that do this. Their meat analog industry is growing. We have the Beyond Burger. We have the Impossible Burger. We have um, all sorts of plant-based nuggets. Uh, Tofurky has been in the industry for a while. And while these are all great alternatives, the problem we have is none of these are whole muscle meats. There's no steak, there's no chicken. And if we're gonna start to wanna grow uh, the products and reach out to more consumers, we're gonna have to have a variety of products that uh, people want. So with that, we need to come up with a solution for that whole muscle fiber, uh, that whole muscle meat, sorry. And also with these kind of patties and ground beefs, a lot of it is little kind of filamentous particles that then have to be stuck together with starches and fats and additives to kind of, to get that texture and to get them to stick together. So all of those little pieces that are involved in making these grounds take a they take a lot of energy. They take a lot of, it's not just a simple process. You can't just, oh, grind up some uh, soybeans or grind up some peas and add, add them in. They're gonna have to be processed in a way to give us that fibrous texture. And specifically we see uh, TVP or texturized vegetable protein is a main ingredient in all of them. While it does provide a unique texture, that filamentous kind of ground beef texture, to make TVP, it's quite an extensive process. And specifically, um, it uses a lot of extrusion, which can have some problems when you're, when it's a, uh, as it's highly processed. And so when we look at um, finding a whole muscle meat alternative, we're pretty limited. And so currently it's either you have to find a plant that is fibrous, such as like jackfruit is pretty common as it can be uh, pulled apart. It's kind of similar to people compare it to more to pulled pork or mushrooms are kind of growing in the industry. But with those plants, you have that limited nutritional value and that limited protein content, meaning that you're gonna to have to add in um, other products to build up that nutritional value. Or we get products where we see, um, where we can get fibers through extrusion or shear cell, shear cell processing. In these pictures here, we can see a shear cell, shear cell <laughs> that's hard to say, shear cell steak and, um, or this small piece of um, extruded protein. However, in these shear cell processes and extrusion, extrusion, it can be kind of problematic as there's incredibly high amounts of pressure and heat that go and kneading and mixing that are involved in this process. And while it can create a unique product, we have to think about the entire process and what it's doing to the actual protein itself. So when you think about extrusion, when I've looked into it, I mean, it creates a filamentous product. However, you're kind of limited on the size as you're left with that cold dye setting at the end that is pretty much that main component which creates those layers. But that limited size means you're going to have to stick all those pieces again together to create that whole muscle meat or that large piece of steak that you're after. And these equipment is quite the equip the equipment to make this is quite expensive. There's large startup costs, meaning that you're going to have to throw a lot of money into this when you don't is when the whole process is kind of no I want to say trial and error, but it's extensive to to determine the exact pressures temperatures to figure it all out. And then with the added temperatures and the added shear, we kind of makes it makes us think like what's happening with the Maillard reaction as that increased kneading and um, shear can expose new reducing sugars and increase the Maillard products. 
And then all these products at the end have additional finishing steps, meaning that they're gonna have to be cooked again and browned again, which I mean, you're kind of cooking this protein until what nutritional value is really left is what, is, that, is what makes me think. And that product is pretty tough as I've had some people, um, I've tasted some myself and I don't, it's more of a beef jerky than a tender steak. And to get that tender steak, it involves marinating and soaking for long periods of time to get that moisture back in the product. So that kind of leaves us with what can we do to fill that gap? And our goal was to develop a novel meat analog that had a fibrous texture to mimic whole muscle meat, extrusion-free processing, plant-based and sustainable. And we came up with a product that uses a prolamine, a protein isolate and a rapid swelling starch to create this novel meat analog. Okay. So first I'm gonna start to talk about the filamentous portion of it. And we discovered that the prolamine or the prolamin is, was uh, best suited for that. So prolamin proteins are hydrophobic proteins. They're found in corn, they're found in zane, sorry, corn, which is zane, wheat, um, gluten, barley, hordin, sorghum is catherine. And so these hydrophobic proteins, a lot of them are considered waste products in the refining process as they do have limited nutritional functionality because they are so hydrophobic and also so they don't have a complete amino acid score. So they're gonna need a protein to supplement that. However, they have very unique structural properties as when they're um, plasticized under the correct conditions, we get these um, fibers that can just be stretched by hand. And when we look here with the addition of water or urea or salt, we don't see um, quite extensive fiber development. But when we look, <clears throat> sorry, when we look into the addition of an organic acid, we can see that these, there are these linear fibers that are able to be extended just manually without the need of any equipment and they form filaments. However, we kind of realized, sure, these prolamins can form these filaments, but there's gonna be a need to, there's gonna need to be a way to support them. And that's where we um, looked into a supporting network for these filaments. And in that, we determined that a rapid swelling starch and a protein isolate was our best bet. So the rapid swelling starch and the protein isolate is kind of like a combo matrix in the sense that the rapid swelling starch, um, when hydrated in a pretty, let's say a limited water condition, it likes to stick together. So all those, so all the starch molecules are kind of fighting for water in a sense, meaning that they're all kind of stuck together and they make this dough-like structure. And so because it's this dough, very extendable structure, it's able to be manually extended and kneaded at the same time as we develop those fibers. And it actually is able to separate the fibers into a more um, fine fibril network. And with the addition of the protein, it actually has a structure function relationship and changes how that starch kind of interacts. It disrupts the structure in a way and actually allows for different type, uh, uh, different mechanical properties and almost enhance the um, extendability and uh, malleability of it with the addition of that added nu um, nutritional value. So together they form this um, unique supporting matrix that uh, we feel is a unique structuring agent in foods that hasn't really been um, looked into extensively. And when we kind of look at uh, some of the data, we can see that the confocal here, with this is increasing protein amounts. This is 30%, 50%, 70%. The protein is actually acting as a particulate filler in the sense that um, the protein is actively filling that continuous starch phase. And we can see that the protein is changing the mechanical properties with, and as the, so with no protein present, we start to increase the amount of protein. The protein is acting as both a solid particle, um, increasing the hardness, but also kind of disrupting how the starch is, uh, so it's not so stuck together. And then the whole, we decided that, that the hardness and the resilience are kind of two of the most important factors, as in order to develop those filaments with the prolamin, they have to be stretched, meaning that our supporting network is also going to have to be stretched and extendable. And we wanted it to be, didn't want it to be extendable extended and then kind of lose its shape. You wanted to keep its structure, meaning it's gonna to have to be incredibly resilient to endure that manual um, manipulation. And we see that 
the, the addition of protein does disrupt some of that um, resilience. However, finding the blend between the amount of protein added with the amount of starch, we can still keep high levels of resilience and be able to have that added nutritional value and also have that um, manipulative uh, dough in itself. And so when we kind of look at how the, uh, that supporting network is able to interact with the addition of the fibers, we see some unique results. As, as I mentioned previously, the protein kind of disrupts the starch and allows it to um, be more extendable and get in between those, uh, those fibers. And so having the proper ratio of that starch and protein, we can see is pretty essential as ratios two, three, and four um, the black bars here is just the starch and the protein with the gray bars being the addition of the fibrils. And so we see that there's not too much difference. Um, it's not adding very much structure, but in our ratio one, we're able to have a pretty high hardness with just the protein and the starch. And actually the addition of these fibrils, it enhances the network, it changes it, it makes it harder. It, the, at this point, the starch and protein are interacting in a way that is allowing these filaments to be separated and um, almost create a unique network in itself. And when we look into the other per mechanical parameters, we see the chewiness and the resilience, the starch and protein by itself, the black bar, we see that it has generally high chewiness and high resilience with just the starch and protein and the addition of the fibrils, it starts to decrease it, um, which is actually the feature that we were looking for in the sense that when you, cut, when you kind of bite into a piece of meat, it's not like a piece of gum or not like a piece of bread. You want to be able to bite through it. And so we don't want extent, um, high amounts of chewiness. We don't want um, it to bounce back like a, a resilient dough. There's some bounce in meat, but a lot of it is these, once these fibers are cooked, they're pretty, they, they keep, their, um, keep their shape and you can be able to bite through them and have that, uh, more desirable mouthfeel. And so the addition of that fibril network, it changes that those textural properties, which is a pretty unique feature in this system. And when we look at the amount of, and then so also we looked into how the fibrils play in this network. And there had to be, we found that there had to be a balance. So the starch protein network, it can only hold so much. As soon as you overload it, we're left with, um, a fibrous network that kind of clumps together, <clears throat> sorry, that kind of clumps together as the analog, it becomes too packed with fibers and there's not enough supporting matrix to separate them. And they tend to clump together and actually reduces the mechanical properties and it loses elasticity and it becomes a more brittle, um, a more brittle network. But on the other spectrum, when we see down here, when we add um, too little, there's not enough prolamine. We don't have any, there's not real any fibrous network. It's more like a, um, a bouncy dough. So finding that blend of which we have uh, the, the ideal amount of fibrils added was also a part of uh, the study we were doing as well to determine um, what was the almost maximum we could add and what was the minimum we can add. And actually the amount of fibers you add, it again changes those textural properties. So you can almost make a product that let's say is more like beef or more like chicken or more like fish for that. I mean, I wouldn't say fish, but, um, or pork. So each of those have different fibrous qualities that you can change based on the amount of uh, prolamine you add. And when we look into some of our confocal here of that, uh, of the fibrous network um, in that supporting matrix, we can see those linear fibers running through it, which, um, in the background, we can see those, uh, the protein isolate is also present and embedded and with the black background being the starch and that it's a unique structure function relationship network that's holding all of this together and creating this neat analog that can be made with your hands, doesn't need expensive equipment. And it actually, it's more sustainable in the sense that we're using a product that people find as a waste and we get a final product that browns just like um, a meat or any product that you're looking to cook. And when we look into a slice of it, we can see those fibers running through it and that the, the supporting starch protein isolate network 
is actually kind of, it's still intact. It's suspending those fibers and it's allowing the product to keep the fibers, but also break in a way that keeps, that has that filamentous texture. And so we think that this product is pretty unique in the sense that we haven't seen anything else like it. And it doesn't involve these expensive uh, machinery. And we're able to just make a product that is quite, quite unique. And so again, the research that we have done is definitely at a lab scale. And eventually we may look into scaling it up or um, scaling it up or trying to figure out other proteins that could be utilized in this unique manner. Um, and that's kind of it for the presentation. Thank you guys for listening. Dr. Maragoni, do you want to add anything in? Oh. No, thank you very much. That was great. Okay, thank you, Stacy, for that excellent presentation. And I quite enjoyed it. Um, so uh, this is time for uh, questions um, from the audience. Uh, so, but uh, while we wait for the questions, I have a, a quick question um, about uh, the implication of the protein starch interactions that you mentioned. Um, so, so now the purpose of the, the, the interaction is to create a functional network that would mimic uh, the meat structure, uh, pseudo meat structure, uh, but at the same time, and you know, this is also intended for uh, nutritional purpose. So, what do you expect uh, will be the outcome of these interactions in terms of their effect on digestibility of both the starch and the protein? Okay, perfect. Um, so, I don't think there's going to be quite any implications on the digestibility as the products that we're using, um, the prolamine itself is uh, regulated for consumption. And also we're using a protein isolate that um, is readily available in the sense that people can make their protein shakes out of it or people use them in other foods. And the starches um, in the same way, it's all regulated for consumption. So we're not too worried about how uh, the, the digestibility is gonna be. Uh, affected, but uh, we're kind of more focusing right now on those textural properties that um, people desire in food as I think um, having those sensory and textural properties is kind of one of the, um, and making this product and that a consumer wants is, is important because people want that desired mouthfeel and those uh, desire and people are more after those characteristics. Um, when they first t uh, bite into it. So again, we, and then developing this uh, method also isn't limiting us to introducing other proteins potentially in the future. So there's, a, there's ways to change the digestibility or functionality in that way as well. If I, may, if I may add, we were one of the reasons for us going into this, we were a little bit concerned, Chibuka, like you were saying about the nutritional qualities of extruded protein under high moisture extrusion usually you have to heat up the protein to 150 degrees under high pressure and shear. And I always wonder whether there were undesirable cross-linking reactions or that would, limit, uh, that would limit digestibility or destroy lysine or things like that. All of these processes are taking place at 60 degrees Celsius. So we're, we're even below the denaturation temperature of the protein. So this is just a, a physical mixture and the nutritional quality of the original material gets preserved into the final product. But you do have to remember that these prolamines usually are, don't have a very high nutritional value. They're strictly there for the textural properties 
and, and but the majority, the bulk of the nutrition comes from the protein and the starch. Uh, but I think what we found in our experience is you have to be really careful choosing these ingredients. The type of starch and the protein plays a huge role and the way it gets processed Many different isolates didn't work, only a certain isolate worked. So I think there's a huge room here for people to really characterize the functional properties of the protein isolates that are available commercially, because there's a huge variability in both protein quality and the starch. Even two starches that are labeled the same are different. We really need to make a, do a better job at characterizing those uh, materials in terms of nutrition and functionality. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stacy and uh, Alejandro. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, so uh, one question is, uh, what would you predict the addition of fat will do to your system? Um, so that's a uh, interesting question. So with the addition of fat, um, I think that there, we, it could create a unique product in the sense that um, the prolamine may, uh, when plasticized differently. Um, however, introducing it in a way that uh, the fat remains solid, I don't think is going to um, re remain solid when it's kind of set and cold. I don't think we'll um, break the structure in any way as it's a quite a strong, there's strong interactions keeping those starches and proteins together as it is a limitedly hydrated network. So adding in another type of fat or in this, in in the sense you're adding in another particle, um, I think we would just have to adjust the amount of starch to protein ratio to um, kind of account for any type of uh, structure loss that may happen with the addition of fat. You, you, you inherently increase the lubrication of all the structures there. We tried, right, Stacey, a couple of times to include something, it, uh, everything starts slipping. So you, you do change the extensional rheological properties of the material with it. So you have to reformulate again, because remember, you need a balance of, of the elasticity, the hardness, the resilience of the supporting network so that you get the extension on that prolamine. You start changing that, you're going to change the processes. But yeah, fat, I think it's, uh, it's, it plays a huge role and we're going to have to explore that uh, carefully. The, the system changes. So, so yeah, you lubricate everything. So now you're changing the extensional rheology, which is what creates those fibers. So that's a great question. Uh, and uh, will we be looking into that uh, next, this week coming week? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stacey and Alex. Um, so uh, our last question that we have from the audience is about the shelf life. Uh, so the question is, uh, what, what, how can you compare the shelf life of the product compared to extruded, the traditionally extruded, extruded products? Is there any difference? Um, so we don't really have any concerns about the shelf life in the sense that um, the product is actually made in a low pH system as that um, as the addition of the organic acid is needed to have that plasticization to make those fibers. So we're working at a pretty low pH um, already. So having that limited pH kind of limits the, uh, the type of growth or um, uh, microbial issues that we would have with that product. Shelf life wise, um, and the type and the ways that I've made it, I um, I vacuum seal the product just like most people would do in their package. And once um, in, I've also previously frozen it, and you can take it out of and let it come to room temperature, and you still regain that uh, those um, the elasticity of it as when it again is heated like any other steak or um, whole muscle meat. Those the heat comes through it again and actually regains some of that um, elasticity within the product. So um, pack, uh, shelf life wise, we don't have uh, too many worries due to that low pH and the methods that we're using to, to make the product. Okay, thank you very much, Stacey. Um, and thank you, uh, Alejandro. Um, so the, this is a very interesting topic and um, I'm quite excited to see uh, you know, this opportunity to discuss it. Uh, so we'll reserve uh, any further questions uh, for the panel discussion. And uh, so I would like to thank you once again, Stacey, for that presentation and Dr. Marangoni for also sharing your insight uh, during the, the question and answer. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, uh, we have uh, a second a speaker, uh, Dr. Michelle Braun. Uh, so a quick introduction of Dr. Braun. Uh, Dr. Michelle Braun uh, is the Global Protein Scientific Affairs Lead for DuPont Nutrition and Biosciences in the United States. Uh, she's a nutrition scientist with experience in clinical research and nutrition translation. Uh, Dr. Brown is currently the Global Protein Affairs League that I had mentioned, and over the course of her career, uh, she has led research investigating a variety of health outcomes with a particular focus on child nutrition. Uh, Dr. Brown is uh, also uh, involved in research conducting uh, several clinical trials related to protein and mineral min uh, metabolism in children. Uh, she's uh, active in several organizations related to the field and has served in volunteer and uh, leadership roles in the American Society of Nutrition, uh, the Institute for Food Technologists, uh, the International Life Sciences Institute, and International Food Information Council. And she's also the current president of the Soy Nutrition Institute. Uh, Dr. Brown has earned her doctorate and master's degree in foods and nutrition from Purdue uh, University. USA uh, with a bachelor's degree in nutrition from Indiana University. So today, Dr. Brown will be talking about delivering high quality protein in a variety of food formats. You're welcome, Dr. Brown. The floor is yours. Hello to everyone. It's my pleasure to join you today. Uh, I appreciate that excellent introduction. And just briefly, I just want to acknowledge, yes, I am with du DuPont Nutrition and Biosciences. Uh, and uh, that company is a provider of a variety of food ingredients, including the Supro line of plant proteins for full disclosure today. Um, as we begin, we would need to acknowledge that the plant-based space is getting very crowded with lots of options. However, there are quantity and quality considerations uh, that we must consider uh, in terms of human health. Quantity is possibly the, the simpler concept, even with the debate of you know, how much protein do we need, uh, because protein is an essential nutrient, meaning we need it every day to support healthy functions of, uh, at the cellular level and tissue level uh, for the entire body. The quantity of protein available is different in, in the sources, in different sources as shown here, um, just as the, the quantity of protein varies in finished foods that we consume, as is shown in the next slide. This is a list of common high protein plant-based foods uh, as you can see, legumes, nuts, and seeds tend to have highest amount of proteins per serving. Uh, vegetables and grains can provide protein as well, although not to the same extent as legumes, nuts, and seeds. There are also food products made from ingredients, from plant ingredients, including soybeans uh, that will deliver uh, plant proteins such as tofu and soy milk, which are more traditional uh, food forms of uh, that are based in, in uh, ingredient versions of plant sources. But we know that this is an exciting area, and we heard from the last speaker uh, of the new food formulations, the new food options that are emerging in the marketplace. Uh, so it's an exciting area to keep tabs on to consider how plant proteins can be a part of our diets and, and end up on our plates each day. So protein is essential, and it, it needs to be included in the diet every day. And clearly, there's a variety of options that can contribute to daily goals, which are generally set at just a, a shorthand way to think about it is of just under one gram of protein to fuel the needs based on each kilogram of body weight, or technically 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. Uh, now, when we think about... Uh, when we move past protein quantity into protein quality, there are differences in the ability of protein sources uh, to meet those, those needs, which are based on the amino acids present in the protein and how well digested uh, the protein is, is, it is digested and utilized by the body. Uh, proteins are made up of different combinations of amino acids. There are nine amino acids that must be obtained in the diet. 
The protein digestibility corrected amino acid score or PDCAS is the method of protein quality measurement based on the principle that the nutritive value of protein depends on its ability to provide amino acids in adequate amounts to meet, to meet the requirements of children and adults. And it's a method for protein, it is the method for protein quality measurement referenced in many of the current nutrition labeling guidelines. And it's used to describe the quality of the protein or its ability to meet the needs of the young and the old. But let's take a look at that. Uh, this is the essential amino acid needs um, as described by this method. And we see here the needs of the very young and young children. PDCAS method uses the needs not of rapidly growing infants, which is a state of metabolism distinct for that time in life, but rather growing children. And it's a conservative measure. If a protein source can meet the needs of children, then it can also meet the needs of adults. And this pattern of essential amino acid is, is needed to fuel healthy growth and development of this age group. Uh, the next slide shows how one plant source or soy, soy protein stacks up to those requirements. As you can see, soy meets the needs of children and thus adults by supplying the essential amino acids in the right proportions uh, to meet needs. Digestibility is taken into consideration um, in, in the values that are shown here. An isolated soy protein uh, has been shown to be on average about 97 to 98% digestible. So it's well digested. It's expected that the more isolated forms of, of any ingredient uh, or plant source uh, can increase in digestibility you know, through processing due to, due to the reduction of uh, the inherent digestion inhibitor. So many plant sources also uh, have with, along with the protein fiber uh, and, and some factors that are considered anti-nutritional factors, such as protease inhibitors, tannins, phytic acid, et cetera. This makes, but the, the processing to remove those, uh, those components uh, in the isolated forms uh, and testing reveals through the PDCAS method that the quality of soy protein as assessed by PDCAS is comparable to milk and egg protein. As a plant source, uh, isolated soy protein is also low in fat, saturated fat, cholesterol-free and, and lactose-free. Um, and as shown here, it can be consumed throughout the life cycle. Now it's recognized that plant proteins uh, do not support health in isolation. It's more than just the quality of the protein. Uh, it, it includes, the plant sources include healthy fats, fibers, antioxidants. You know, these are, we, we get so many nutrients from plant sources. Over the past decade, there's been a shift in nutrition guidance from focusing on single nutrients, um, such as reducing saturated fat and sodium or increasing fiber and potassium, to now concentrating on dietary patterns. This shift likely occurred for several reasons. Nutrients are not consumed in isolation and therefore interactions of, uh, between foods are missed. And the importance of dietary patterns that combine various foods and nutrients can't be overlooked uh, related to their significant effect on health and in a way that's, uh, that can be well digested uh, as we translate nutrition and, and diet guidance to the public. Therefore, global health authorities are moving away from nutrient-based recommendations in, in favor of dietary pattern-based recommendations, and diets rich in plant foods, fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts, seeds, soy products, and vegetable oils are increasingly being recommended by many, of author many authorities, uh, as shown here, due to the strong evidence supporting the beneficial health effects uh, and associations of higher consumption with lower risk of diseases such as cardiometabolic disease. So dietary recommendations based on high quality research that substantiate many aspects of health can, be, can, can support the inclusion of plant-based uh, foods in the diet. And soy plays a significant role in many of these well-studied dietary patterns. And here's just a short list. Dietary patterns are frequently recommended by international dietary and clinical practice guidelines, um, and, and especially when we think about heart disease risk. So a few of the diets that um, include 
soy and are well studied for their health effects are listed here, including the Mediterranean diet, which is high in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and olive oil. Uh, this has been well studied in terms of uh, its effects on, on persons who are at high risk for cardiovascular disease and its efficacy. The DASH diet or the dietary approach to stop hypertension diet uh, also recommends four to five servings of plant sources per week. Um, the low GI, GI diet or glycemic index diet may be popular uh, where, where you are. Um, and of course, the vegetarian diet, uh, that's fairly straightforward, uh, that, uh, that uh, plant sources would be endorsed within the vegetarian diet. And it's important to recognize that soy is an essential high quality protein source for vegetarians to help meet their needs in a, in a single source uh, and help to bridge any gaps that may come through adhering to that diet. Um, and the list goes on. Uh, so a common theme for these dietary patterns is that they are primarily plant-based and soy can play a significant role within them. So we're talking about optimizing health, but we do need to recognize that there's significant evidence showing that dietary guidelines are not being met in many countries and consumer populations, while overconsumption of foods, high in saturated fats and added sugars is contributing to the increasing prevalence of overweight, obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. There are nutrition challenges that are faced in many parts of the globe that can contribute to deficiencies of key nutrients, such as vitamin A, iron, zinc, and protein. And this can be compounded by digestion challenges such as lactose intolerance, which make foods that deliver many of these nutrients from dairy sources a less optimal solution. So let's just underscore the importance of these nutrients uh, that were highlighted on the previous map. Um, for example, lactose intolerance is thought to impact about 65% of the world's population, causing gastrointestinal distress and bloating. Vitamin A affects 25% of preschool children and pregnant women in developing countries and can lead to difficulty in seeing in low light as, or uh, to the extreme blindness. For iron deficiency, 30% of the world's population may be impacted with 50% of pregnant women and 40% of preschool children in developing countries. Signs and symptoms of iron deficiency include anemia, weakness, fatigue, and shortness of breath. And 17% of the world's population may be impacted by zinc deficiency, which is associated with compromised immunity and stunted growth, to name a few. Possibly less well-recognized is protein, energy, malnutrition. More than a third of the world's children can be impacted by, by this condition. So there are plant-based products that can help to address these concerns by contributing these important nutrients. Oops, I just clicked away. Here we go. And here's a, an example. Now, I know this is a busy slide, but it includes the nutrition data for a product that can function as a cow's milk alternative. Uh, the nutrition profile shares many key nutrients found in whole milk. The products are compared on a, 100, on a per 100 gram basis. So we have whole milk uh, powder, whole cow's milk uh, powder uh, listed in the first column, followed by two soy-based, uh, fortified soy-based uh, ingredient offerings. And one way to think about how to compare these on a per serving uh, basis is uh, to roughly divide by three, where a glass of milk, cow's milk delivers uh, about eight grams of high quality protein. And if we divide uh, these, uh, the other two products, similarly, we'll see that they, that the, the fortified soy-based alternative also delivers at least eight grams of protein per serving, along with a, a, a meaningful amount of vitamin A, zinc, and calcium. So uh, this is a viable option for addressing some of those nutrients of need and concern. And this ingredient can be used in a variety of, uh, in a variety of foods or eating experiences from a traditional beverage that can be reconstituted with clean potable water, uh, but also can serve as a, as a nutritious base for desserts, yogurts, frozen desserts, and soups. So it's nice to have those eating options and the variety in terms of, of the different foods that can manifest it on, on the plate um, for families to consume. Uh, the powdered products aren't the only way that soy ingredients uh, can be uh, available. So ingredients can come in a variety of forms and formats for inclusion in recipes or formulas of new or, of new or familiar foods. Powders do deliver uh, application specific you know, functionality for beverages. So whether it's a dry 
product uh, that's to be reconstituted or ready to drink um, or spray dried, uh, high quality protein can come through in the powder products. These are also uh, often used in meat or poultry or meat free uh, uh, applications as well. So this is the most versatile form um, that can be used in general protein fortification. But soy protein has been in the marketplace uh, long enough that there are many other forms and formats that are available. Extruded products, such as nuggets, um, that can add crispy or crunchiness to uh, an eating experience, such as in a bar or cereal or snack, um, can, can deliver high-quality protein where a lot of times we think of a lower quality protein, such as a rice crisp being in that space can be swapped out for a protein crisp. Um, and other extruded products can deliver different eating experiences. Um, uh, textured soy protein concentrate is available in flakes and granules and crumbles, which works well in meat and poultry um, or meat-free versions of those applications. Um, and structured vegetable protein can mimic the whole muscle texture, um, uh, whole muscle-like texture uh, in shreds, chunks, and strips formats. And of course, you know, as we heard in the previous talk, this is a very exciting area uh, where soy has a head start in terms of the innovation um, that has been applied and what we know uh, of, of how this ingredient can manifest in a variety of foods and formats. So let's return to the topic of protein quality and discuss for a moment the applicability of this, of this method. Now we're going to switch into the health aspects of the talk and, and I will try not to overstay my welcome. In terms of the tool PDCAS, we've talked about how soy is a high quality source meeting the needs of children as well as adults. And as you can see in this chart, uh, PDCAS method reveals that soy is a high quality source of protein similar to milk and egg. Uh, when a protein source is lower on the chart, it's likely due to it, the presence of you know, a lower amount of one or more essential amino acids, uh, meaning those, those amino acids that we must obtain in the diet. Uh, the protein source may also be lower in digestibility, uh, and we've talked a lot about that. So we've also recognized that protein is an, is an important nutrient essential in the diet to fuel healthy growth and development. But children who face food scarcity challenges at, and develop severe acute malnutrition need safe, palatable foods that have energy, protein, protein, fats, minerals, and vitamins tailored to meet their needs to recover. So now we're not talking about uh, uh, optimizing daily health, but how can we assess whether a protein source can help to recover um, from severe acute malnutrition? Now, globally, 20 million children suffer from severe acute malnutrition, but with proper treatment can, can grow up to lead normal or productive lives. Uh, several years ago, DuPont Nutrition and Biosciences partnered with the United Soybean Board to develop and test a high-quality soy-based recovery product. Researchers in this field were seeking treatments uh, and investigated the efficacy of the product uh, that was soy-based in comparison to the traditional milk peanut-based product to support recovery, provide high-quality nutrition, and uh, investigate whether this may be a more cost-effective uh, treatment for affected populations. And, and this was compared to the standard of care. In treating severe acute malnutrition, the World Health Organization recommends energy-dense liquid energy dense liquid peanut paste, sorry, that's a mouthful, that are enriched with vitamins and minerals and include those high cost dairy ingredients. Um, these pastes deliver much needed high quality protein, but often pose tolerance and digestion challenges in affected patients. So I have an image of, of what our product essentially looked like um, in cartoon at the, the bottom of the slide. Uh, but what's important is uh, whether a product, uh, it's not just to be able to make it, but does it to does it support recovery? The researchers found that the soy-based ready-to-use therapeutic food was equally acceptable as the milk-based RUTF or ready-to-use therapeutic food. Plus the children who received it showed similar patterns of weight gain, rate of weight gain, and other positive changes in anthropometric measures and body composition as those receiving the milk-based ready-to-use therapeutic food. So this study demonstrated that the RUTF made with high quality soy protein can be an effective treatment for children with severe acute malnutrition. So this is really the manifestation of protein quality. Uh, you know, a protein may be 
considered high quality in terms of the PDCAS method, but can it equally support other recognized high quality sources of uh, support recovery as other high quality sources of protein? Uh, the answer to that question is yes from this from this study. And we also were found, uh, found an alternative that may be more well tolerated um, for the treatment of children with severe acute malnutrition. So this study was significant because it provides evidence that rescue food, foods for children with SAM can be more affordive, affordable, yet equally effective. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit more beyond the needs of children who are suffering from severe acute malnutrition to the evidence that uh, has been established on how soy can support health um, and many aspects of health across the lifespan. Soy is probably the most well-studied plant source of protein where research substantiates its effects supporting healthy growth and development, which we've talked about. Um, but also soy has been shown to support several aspects of weight management, lean tissue, and what may be best well known due to the hundreds of studies investigating this area are the heart health effects that have led to numerous claims in countries around the globe. So let's begin by focusing in on those heart health benefits. Soy has been demonstrated to support several aspects of heart health from reducing risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease or direct reduction of development of cardiovascular disease uh, to you know, other aspects of health maybe that we can think of that we think of earlier in life as supporting optimal health of blood vessels. Really this is a robust area of research. And we're going to talk about each and every study. Now, I'm just teasing. I am a fan of sharing meta-analyses. And there's been so much research in soy and heart health that there's actually been multiple meta-analyses. So we're looking at the totality of high-quality studies that are available at a particular time um, when authors uh, uh, conducted their meta-analyses of looking at the totality of the evidence. Um, what's similar across these studies, and you can see I have seven studies selected at the top of the slide, um, what's similar is that each of the authors considered the risk factors uh, for cardiovascular disease as their health outcomes. Total cholesterol, pictured in blue, um, LDL or the bad cholesterol, pictured in red, triglycerides in purple, and HDL in green. And these are also some of the outcomes that are considered in the health claim dossiers that are in place in over 27 countries, um, or, or excuse me, in over 12 countries around the globe. Um, uh, so uh, what's uh, notable of, from the outcomes of these meta-analyses is, is the agreement across the different studies that uh, no matter when the authors uh, selected uh, their studies uh, and or the quality criteria that were considered, uh, each of these studies demonstrates that soy protein can lower total cholesterol um, and LDL cholesterol and triglycerides without lowering HDL cholesterol, which is actually quite notable. Um, so so many studies have been conducted on, on soy and heart health that we have this uh, strong foundation when we talk about the heart health benefits of, of soy. Um, another health outcome area that's of interest uh, and to consumers, um, and because it, they think of it more about an immediate need, and that's in, in, uh, a product's ability to help to support their weight management goals. Uh, what's interesting for soy is that uh, the research that's been conducted shows that soy is, is effective both in the short-term aspects of weight management, which is uh, notably assessed in terms of satiety or the feeling of fullness. Um, uh, so several studies have demonstrated, like other high-quality sources of protein, soy can support uh, satiety um, and also can help to reduce, you know, by consuming soy at one eating occasion, it may help to impact uh, caloric intake over the, at the next meal over the course of the day. Now, if we were to, to repeat that uh, for multiple days, then we get to a longer-term uh, intervention such as weight loss, which soy has been well-studied in terms of its effects uh, in supporting weight loss uh, in comparison to other high quality sources of protein. And really those studies are considering what's happening for the duration of the intervention. But what happens when the weight loss study or the weight loss program uh, uh, concludes? Well, that's when we hear a lot about uh, the yo-yo or people re 
um, regaining a lot of that weight. So there's been research that assesses soy's ability to support weight maintenance um, or the ability to maintain that weight loss. Uh, and studies showed that while some weight regain does occur um, when people are free living and no longer a part of a program where they know that, uh, that they're working towards that goal, um, what is observed is that the weight regain is not in fat tissue, but in lean tissue. So there's definitely some impact there on, on the, uh, the lean tissue or muscle tissue um, uh, in terms of uh, you know, protein's ability to drive accretion of lean tissue. Um, and then of course, by including soy in a weight loss uh, intervention or weight loss program, it can help to support lasting or long-term effects uh, uh, with, in terms of cardiometabolic health. And that relates back to the heart health benefits, which we've well discussed. So let's drill down on that lean tissue or the muscle health effects. This will probably be the busiest slide that I show you today. Um, but again, it's a meta-analysis. So we hear so much about uh, the, uh, the effect of uh, proteins on muscle. And a lot of that attention is driven by the acute studies or the very short-term studies that look at uh, how muscle is metabolizing and utilizing protein sources in the short term after exercise. This meta-analysis, uh, I, I really like this one because it only takes into consideration those of longer terms, the chronic studies that compare soy to other high quality sources of protein, which are animal sources. And we are looking at health outcomes uh, related to lean body mass gains and strength. And the blue diamonds, since they are um, right uh, aligned with each other, demonstrate that, that there are no differences between soy and uh, whey protein or other animal protein sources uh, that were uh, taken into consideration in, in this um, in this study for support of, uh, of these health outcomes uh, re uh, related to uh, muscle. So the, the conclusions that soy, pro that soy stimulates muscle protein synthesis or, muscle, or supports muscle health to a lesser extent than whey protein um, is really driven by those acute studies. And it's a false conclusion um, as demonstrated here in this research. Oh dear. Um, and finally, um, you know, it's an exciting area of research uh, still to be in the business of, of uh, uncovering how soy can affect, affect health. Um, as we think about our current challenges that we face in terms of obesity and how the gut, gut microbiome may interplay with some of the emerging areas of investigation, including glucose and insulin metabolism and other uh, aspects of metabolic health. So uh, lots to keep an eye on in terms of research related to soy and health. So in conclusion, um, you know, there's evidence to support that uh, the inclusion of plant sources in the diet can support health and, and, and optimize health, but also address risk factors associated with conditions that affect many people, whether it's severe acute malnutrition for children or heart health for those who are uh, at the other end of the lifespan. Uh, due to differences in composition, different dietary plant protein sources may have differing effects on health. There, we just don't have as much research on other plant sources as we do on soy. And diets uh, that include uh, plant sources can be adapted to local traditions as, as uh, ingredients uh, that are soy-based can take a variety of forms and formats, but it's important to still be mindful of including uh, sources that are demonstrated to support health. And with that, I will conclude and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Brown, for that excellent presentation. Um, so you have uh, quite a number of questions from the audience, uh, but I also have uh, one question. So we'll start with the audience questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, are you aware of any in vitro or non-animal testing alternatives uh, for measuring uh, PDCAS? That's a great question. This is a, um, a, a there's very much a changing landscape in terms of the assessment of protein quality. Uh, and there 
is an outcry from many uh, consumer groups to avoid animal testing. It's interesting because protein is, uh, in many uh, regulatory jurisdictions, protein is the only nutrient that we must report that's based on animal testing. Um, And so there are viable uh, in vitro methods that are current, that have been in place for, for a number of years, but not yet adopted by regulatory authorities. Um, Therefore, uh, you know, they are often utilized by manufacturers, uh, but they are not necessarily 100% aligned with in line with regulations. Um, but I, you know, we are caught between uh, a, a dynamic where we're we're moving closer to animal methods if we were to adopt, say, the the dias method using the swine model, and consumers wish to avoid animal testing. Um, So this is really an area that requires a lot of attention in the years ahead um, and and recognition that for now we are tied to the PDCAS method, which uses a a rat digestibility um, method. Great question. All right, thank you. Um, so the next question um, is not particularly on proteins. Uh, it says, is there a research scale that your company will be interested in evaluating uh, soybean seeds uh, with an enhanced seed composition for carbohydrates and oil? So is there a research scale that your company will be interested in? I'd be happy to have a follow-up. I'd be happy to follow up, up follow up offline um, with that individual, and we can we can discuss that. Um, and if it's it's not us, it may be another partner um, in the supply chain. Um, but yes, it's an exciting area for sure. Okay, uh, and then the last question um, is uh, from coming from me. Um, so you presented different metrics uh, through which. Uh, soybean or other plant uh, protein ingredients could be incorporated into food. Uh, So do you see any potential variation in terms of the quality of the protein delivered when uh, using say the protein isolate or concentrate of flour in different matrices? Well, we do know that the, the quality as assessed by PDCAS uh, shifts as we talk about the more processed that are less processed. So soy flour has a lower protein quality than concentrate, than isolate. Um, concentrate and isolate, depending, you know, the, the definitions of concentrate and isolate, you can, you know, there's a, there's a band, right? So concentrates uh, have been demonstrated to have similar protein quality to some isolates. Um, but I think the previous speaker also acknowledged that there are differences depending on which concentrate. Um, I think what you're also getting at um, is if we were to process those further into extruded products, how that might impact protein quality. Um, our testing thus far uh, demonstrates that, uh, that the effect in extrusion is minimal. Um, and when we take an isolate into an extruded product, we, we still see uh, high quality um, uh, in terms of how uh, PDCAS, but uh, there's more research that's, that's needed there. There's not as much data as we have for the flowers, the concentrates, and the isolates in, in their uh, native forms. We also um, have uh, a paucity of data in terms of other uh, food forms. So we know less um, about some of the other uh, food forms that may be derived from whole bean and really where they fit in, in that, that lineup. Um, I think a lot, a lot of times we've just been using the, the, the ingredient values, um, but that testing hasn't been conducted in the same manner. And as we're, um, as we just talked about in the previous question, we're in a shifting landscape in terms of uh, methods for protein quality. Uh, those those data may be um, forthcoming in in the future. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Braun, uh, for your excellent presentation and answers to the questions.
Okay, uh, welcome to the third uh, presentation uh, this morning. Uh, so we have uh, a speaker, uh, Dr. Keshan uh, Liu. So I will briefly introduce uh, Dr. Liu. Uh, so uh, Keshan Liu is a research chemist uh, with uh, uh, United States Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Research Service. Uh, born in rural China, he received uh, his master's and PhD degrees in food science from Michigan State University in the US. We, and also did a postdoctoral work at Coca-Cola Company and the University of Georgia. Uh, and after that, uh, prior to joining USDA in 2005, he was employed at Monsanto and the University of Missouri. Uh, Dr. Liu's expertise is in the area of chemistry, processing and value added utilization of soybeans. And this uh, work uh, in his uh, lab has uh, spanned uh, over the last 35 years uh, of his career at uh, different academic institutions, private industry and uh, government agencies. Uh, Dr. Liu has co-authored over 137 publications, uh, organized uh, several conferences and symposia and scientific meetings, and has also given over 110 technical presentations at many conferences uh, uh, nationally and internationally. Um, so he has, uh, Dr. Liu has extensive uh, uh, experience as a journal editor and a book editor. And uh, one of his books is Soybean as uh, Functional Foods and Ingredients, published by AOCS Press in 2005. And uh, his uh, scientific achievements uh, and contributions are also uh, 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 shown in his activities in different scientific organizations, uh, including uh, AOCS. And that has led to uh, various recognitions, including uh, AOCS Merit Award in 2010 and AOCS Fellow in 2011 an IFT fellow in 2014, uh, as well as the first AOCS Protein and Co-Product Division Lifetime Achievement Award uh, in 2020. Uh, Dr. Liu uh, today will be speaking to us about developing low cost soy protein concentrates for expanding soy protein utilization. Uh, welcome Dr. Liu and uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Chikubi, for your introductions. Um, Again, my name is Keshe Liu. I'm with the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Research Service. So today I'm going to talk about a project that have been done a few years ago. Um, so it's about developing low-cost soy protein concentrates. Let me see. Oh, just one minute. Sorry. Okay. So Keishan, you can try hitting enter or one of your arrow buttons. Huh? Sorry, <laughs> where, the, where the screen is? You, eh? you can also um, look down and you see on the right hand side where there's some arrows on your PowerPoint file. Uh huh. And you can click um, the one to the right. Uh, maybe the zoom is gone. Uh, let me see. Oh, yeah, that's terrible. I don't know where, where is this uh, screen on, out? Uh, uh, where is this screen? It's okay, Keishan, I'm gonna get your slides up and I'm just gonna advance them for you. Okay, so just give me one second. Uh, I don't support to see this content, but right now I cannot see the content. Uh, maybe I start over again, okay, sorry. I just, I just leave the, leave
Thank you, uh, Chikubi, for your good present, uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Keshe Liu. Uh, I'm with the U.S. Department of Agriculture Agricultural Research Service. So today I'm going to talk about a project we've been, uh, we was done a few years ago on developing soil soil low-cost soil protein concentrates. This is a presentation outline. Uh, I will give a very brief uh, introduction on soybeans in terms of what production and the processing and uh, utilization, soy protein products. Uh, within soy protein product, I will focus a little bit more on the soy protein concentrate uh, in terms of opportunity and the challenges. Then I will talk uh, on the project on developing lower cost soy protein concentrates in terms of strategy, method, product feature, and applications. And this slide shows the uh, last 50 years of the world soybean production uh, from 1970 until this year. So you can see the soybean production increase steadily, particularly in the last 20 years. Uh, currently, the world total soybean production annual uh, production is uh, estimated at uh, 380 uh, million metric tons. Oh, just maybe too fast. <laughs> um, the Brazil is a leading uh, soybean production. Uh, a couple of years ago, the U.S. is leading soybean production. Now Brazil surpassed the U.S. as the number one soybean producer. And this followed by the U.S., Argentina, China, India, etc. Um, now, come to the questions. Uh, why we do we need to process soybeans? Well, soybeans are not like a rice, so we can eat cooked like we can eat cooked rice every day, no problem. But the soybeans, after cooked, is is edible, but you cannot eat every day. So we have to process it, soybean to various uh, type of food, uh, soy food or soy ingredients. Also, it's necessary to press soybean reduce the uh, eliminate uh, bean flavors and uh, reduce and eliminate certain anti-nutrients. Also increase the value of soy industry so by processing and uh, provide benefits to consumer. Uh, so they have, so consumer can have nutritious, healthy and variety tasty uh, soy, soy food. Soybean also uh, contain many bioactive compounds. Uh, some of them are being considered as have health benefits, but may, most others have been traditionally considered anti-nutritional. So those bioactives uh, have been catalyzed, uh, generally catalyzed as a heat liable and a heat stable groups. So in terms of the heat liables, uh, the two examples is the chips and hipsters. Uh, then the lectins, vertical hemagglutinins. The heat stable is the one we will focus today. Is the uh, two major one is the oligosaccharides, uh, as shown on the top right, the molecular structure. Uh, major one, and the circle, of course, is the one of them. But uh, uh, the two actually major concern is the regular and the stacules. Uh, so it being contained about 3.5% of refugees on a dry mass basis, about one something, one percent a little bit high on saccules. So they are uh, together about five, I think about four or five percent. Uh, so relatively high in the soybeans. So they are trisaccharides as she was here, uh, or tetrasaccharides, consist of uh, glucose, fructose, and uh, galactose. The other one is a uh, fatty acid. Uh, it's also a heat stable. Uh, fatty acid is an in inositol ester of phosphate. Uh, it is a major phosphorus storage compound in plant material, uh, particularly in soybeans. I think it contains about uh, one point one to two percent uh, in the soybeans. So, phytate. 
can reduce mineral absorption uh, in animals, right, or for including humans. In terms of soybean processing, we have traditional processing and a modern processing. The traditional soy processing, which uh, is created about 2,000 years ago in the Far East, uh, they can be as a fermented soy, soy foods, including like a soy sauce, miso, lettuce, also not fermented, soy milk and tofu, soy sprout. And some of these products have been uh, in the Western market for many years. Here's a picture you can see uh, different tofu. Uh, I mean, nowadays, I think certainly people are very familiar with some of these soy food. More than soybean processing, uh, is a major feature is the soybean extraction. So um, not going to get a detail about this process and we have a speaker previously talk about uh, this area. And the major products is a soy oil which is uh, mostly for edible applications. And then the deep and the soy meal. Um, in the deep and soy meal, uh, we have two types of products. One is the water flakes, which is a desumptized at a lower temperature. I think we'll have a previous speaker, Mr. Richard Wooser, uh, talk about water flake production. Then the, the other is a major one, is toasted soy meal, uh, which is during this desumptizing is, uh, was a, so a meal was uh, uh, heated, uh, toasted. The, the most some uh, currently, uh, they may in, uh, the mechanical processing, like a, like a screw and a hard rock process has been a very traditional method, but not really very much used for soybeans because the, this process is more for the high oil uh, content, the oil seed, like a rap seed, some other oil seed. But uh, get a, for soybeans, get a much more popular one is a uh, extruding uh, expressing um, process. I think it was uh, originally in invented, uh, created in the University of Illinois uh, in the 60s. <clears throat> uh, this process also known as the extrusion aided school process, a present. So we have a few days ago, Dr. Wilma, which in uh, give a talk on this uh, process. So both this uh, alternative process produce oil and the partially defied soy cake. Now this one just show the outline of the uh, alternative processing uh, through the core EE process, extruding and expanding method. So we start with oil seeds, um, then deholing, is optional. Then uh, through then dry extruding so to disrupt this cell structure. Um, then also heat the soy soybeans at the different levels. So this uh, four five extruders look like a very oily material. Uh, so my next step is expanding so the press and the oil out. Uh, this and then have cooled oil. Then also the uh, the called diff, partially defined soy cake uh, contain about five to ten percent of oil content compared with originally about twenty percent oil oil content in the soybean material. Now, soybeans have been processed. The modern processing of the soy oil has been edible uh, for edible application mostly, but the soy protein uh, part is uh, actually currently major part is used for animal feed. But for human uh, consumption, uh, we process soybean uh, protein cake into different type of ingredients. Uh, the four major types is soy flour, soy protein concentrate, soy protein isolate, and plexed soy protein products. Uh, one of the reasons also is the traditional soy foods are not well accepted. Uh, quite a few are still not well accepted. Um, so those are made, mostly made from deep and soy, and, uh, like white flakes. Uh, some are from whole soy or partially deep and soy. I mentioned about soy cakes. So they are incorporated into various Western foods. Uh, so also, uh, as we talked to this, uh, with this morning session, how uh, two to three speakers talk about meat analogs. 
So soy protein ingredients is a major ingredient for we call new generation soy foods, uh, which including the uh, meatless uh, analog, uh, meat analog, or meatless burger, or meatless uh, steak, whatever. So this process, uh, this uh, chart shows how these three major soy protein products are made. Uh, so from left is the soy flour, it's a, it's a simple one just through uh, particle reduction. And to the far right is a soy protein isolate, which is this alcohol extraction and acid precipitation. And the middle way is a uh, soy protein concentrate. As this is uh, typically through aqueous alcohol extraction, a uh, leaching process. So from left to the right, there's a more complexity in the processing. Also the cost, production cost is increasing. Uh, this one shows the three major soy protein ingredients in terms of the compositions. Uh, compared with different soy flour, the soy protein concentrates contain, uh, because soluble carbon hydrate is, redu is removed, reduced. So uh, other composition like uh, soluble carbon hydrates are similar to uh, soy flour. Uh, the protein content increased to about 65%. But further, for the soy isolate, the insoluble carbon hydrate and the soluble carbon hydrate are both removed. So their protein content is much higher. Now we focus the board for this talk to talk about soy protein concentrate because soy protein content have an opportunity. We can see that the, uh, the soy flour is not ideal for protein enrichment uh, because that contain heat stable anti-nutrients such as oligosaccharides and uh, phytate. Uh, they can cause flatus. So the soy, uh, they have also have a finny flavor. So inclusion level typically in the food product is uh, limited, uh, mostly uh, less than 10%. In comparison, soy protein content is better than soy flour uh, because the protein content is a high, significantly high and they contain less heat stable anti-nutrients and less thinny flavor. But soy protein content have some challenges. Uh, first of all, the price is between soy flour and isolate. So it is relatively uh, expensive um, for, for some processor I mean, tell with the product development. So also the uh, limit availability in certain areas, certain regions. So a couple of years ago, uh, at the USDA, my colleague, Dr. Rick Barrows, uh, now retired, and I took a project to develop a low-cost soy protein concentrates. So our objective is uh, reduce the production cost while keeping the uh, nutritional value as the same as the regular soy protein concentrate. Uh, this project was partially funded by Indiana Soybean Allies. Of course, USDA is the major is a major fund funder for us um, for this project. This slide shows the principle of making soy protein concentrate. Uh, they start with the soy um, cake, soy flake or meal. Then we insolubilize protein while leach or extract soluble components, and then keep the insoluble carbohydrate and the protein in the final product. <clears throat> so our strategy is, is identify key steps in the common soy protein process, which is the aqueous alcohol extraction process, uh, leaching process. So we make uh, modifications. Uh, here show uh, several um, key aspects uh, in terms of the raw material and uh, so solvent selection and the uh, drying stages. So we, we develop a three uh, strategy. The strategy one, we select low cost starting material. So currently uh, the product is used the water flakes, which are made at, uh, with a uh, minimum or some level of uh, heat treatment. Uh, this material is relatively expensive. So we select alternative low cost locally available material uh, such as um, 
different soil meal, uh, toast the different soil meal, also the partially different soil take from the uh, EE process uh, I just talked about. Then regardless of what the material, uh, even though they are lower cost, but the key is that this material should be in food grade uh, because we are going to eat the product. Our second strategy is to choose alternative leaching solvents. Um, the currently, they use alcohol, uh, ethanol, as a, uh, aqueous ethanol as a leaching solvent. So this uh, can be uh, uh, in terms of the process and you have a lot of environmental issues. They have uh, the equipment got a much cost to have uh, involved with the solventizing steps to remove the uh, uh, ethanol. So we choose the uh, simplest and the uh, cheapest um, solvent is the uh, water. Uh, this will process the alcohol-free process and can eliminate uh, the solventizing states, steps and environmental uh, friendly process. Uh, our strategy, third strategy is to choose alternative dry method. Uh, currently, uh, the wet soil protein content is dry through the spray drying, which give a uh, powdery products. Uh, so very, uh, the flu, flu, free fluid products. But the spray drying is good, but it's expensive. So we need uh, to choose uh, inexpensive I and mean, locally available drying methods. Uh, this method uh, should have a lower initial capital cost, uh, easy to operate, uh, effective in uh, drying. So example include like a rotate drain dryer, uh, fluidized bed dryer, lower cost convective dryer, and a solar dryers, or a combination of these uh, dry methods. Let's try to show the uh, methods uh, developed a few years ago uh, for making lower cost soil protein concentrates. We start with soil meal, uh, we just talk about raw material, uh, extract soluble component with plain water, uh, go through liquid solid separation, uh, then washing step is optional. Uh, through washing, uh, you use more water, but the increase protein content in the final product. Uh, the drying is through the uh, low cost drying method I just discussed discuss. So because we will not use a spray drying, so the particle size or dry product may not be ideal for certain applications. So the we can add additional step of grinding the, the product and make the powder. Uh, this is the visual appearance of total type of soil protein content. On the left is the commercially available soil protein uh, concentrate, what's called regular concentrate. Uh, this is uh, through the alcohol leaching method and the spray dry product. On the right is a product made by the low cost uh, uh, method. Uh, you can see the color relatively a little bit of brown. We are talk a few of this uh, uh, research done in the lab, in my laboratory. Um, we use the, this method to uh, apply this method to four type of soy, uh, soy meal or soy flake. The first on the left one is a different soy flake. Uh, they have the highest uh, protein dispersibility index called PDI. The higher the PDI, the less the uh, deterioration of protein. So 90% uh, to 70 and 20%. Uh, then we also use the lower fat soy flour made by the EE uh, process and methods called extruding expanding method. And the other flour have about 40% of PDI. So as you can see, the, uh, the protein contents are starting about 55% for the different soy flour, and partially different about 52 uh, because they still have a residual fat. But during this uh, process, uh, with a high PDI sample, actually the protein content is reduced because they're being extracted with the water, extracted out. But for rest, uh, for 70, 20, and 40 PDI sample, 
the protein uh, content are increased, uh, in particular for the last two items, uh, toast deep and uh, soy flour and low fat soy flour, uh, the protein content uh, increased significantly. So the uh, the protein recovery in the final products also increased to about 75 to 80 percent. So this is we had to choose the right uh, raw material with a lower PDI is better. And let's talk about how this process reduced the oligosaccharides. As you can see in the original soy meal, oligosaccharides, which is expressed as a rapid equivalent. Uh, so our methods cannot distinguish between raffinol and stacker. So they express as a raffinol equivalent. So uh, all these four type of material, uh, regardless of PDI uh, value, this, they give a similar reduction, almost around 95%. So it's a very, uh, almost, almost immediate by this process. Uh, this table shows the, how the fatty acid uh, get reduced by the process. Again, with this four type of soy meal, uh, soy meal as a raw material, uh, they, the inner content around 2%, but through this process, uh, we get about similar reduction around 60%, uh, although not as high as uh, oligosaccharides, but the uh, uh, reduction in 60% is still significant. I think mostly because the fatty acid have some bonding with proteins. This chart shows a comparison uh, for regular soy protein concentrates and the lower cost soy protein concentrates. Uh, in the in several uh, parameters, so protein content, uh, the low cost soy protein content may be slightly lower in protein content because they around sixty five, but for regular one minimum is sixty five percent, and some about seventy percent. So nutritional value uh, is almost similar uh, in terms of the uh, oligosaccharide, fatty acids, or some other uh, compositional uh, attributes are uh, similar. Then solubility and the fractionality uh, is, uh, as we can expect, they are much reduced because we use uh, the meal that have been denatured. Uh, the product size, okay, we can uh, get a similar because we can uh, use additional grinding to get a similar uh, fineness. The color is uh, brown as I show in the picture. Um, the flavor and the order, they are, uh, they have some uh, roast uh, nutty flavor. In terms of applications, uh, it's compared to regular uh, soy protein concentrate, which have much higher, uh, broader applications because they can be used for, because, because they are watercolor, they, can, they are more soluble fraction, they can be used for beverage, um, uh, many, some other application. But for this low cost uh, soy protein application, uh, the still relatively uh, can be applied for quite a few products like uh, porridge, breakfast cereals, snacks, uh, bakery products, uh, desserts. Uh, also for meat patty, sausage, uh, uh, possibly for meat analogs. So they are for protein enrich enrichment purpose or as a main ingredient for the product. So it can also be further processed into extruded soy protein product or uh, textured soy protein product, so which is uh, many used as uh, for meat analog. Here they show some of these applications uh, in different uh, categories, the porridge, the bakery, uh, breakfast cereals, uh, meat uh, patties, and snacks, and the sausage. Now, this is the last uh, uh, slide. So hopefully uh, for this presentation, you can have, get some takeaway uh, message. Uh, so traditional soy foods appear less to many people. So soy protein products are widely used as an ingredient in variety of soy pr products, protein product, soy food product, variety of food products. So soy protein concentrate is better than soy flour, but it costs more uh, with uh, limited availabilities. 
So a few years ago at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, we developed a method for making low-cost soy protein concentrate. The low-cost soy protein concentrate is brown in color and less water soluble, but it have same composition, same composition as a regular uh, soy protein concentrate. It has a broad application in many local foods, and uh, the method uh, I think is a uh, adaptable in sub-Sahara Africa region. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kishan Liu, for your presentation. Um, and I just wanted to mention that uh, questions to Dr. Liu will be posed uh, during the panel discussion. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, we'll just move uh, right uh, into the fourth and the last presentation uh, for this uh, session. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker for this uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Constantina uh, Kiriakopoulou. Uh, Dr. Kiriakopoulou is uh, a postdoctoral uh, fellow at the Vag Wageningen University uh, Research uh, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kira Kuplo studied chemical engineering at the National Technical University of Athens in Greece, where she also completed her PhD studies. In 2017, she joined the food process engineering group at Wageningen, and uh, there she is a postdoctoral researcher uh, doing research in the area of sustainable fractionation of natural products for the recovery of functional and bioactive food ingredients. Uh, her main focus is on plant-based proteins, uh, particularly in understanding their functionality and exploring their structuring potential for the formulation of a next generation meat analogs. Uh, so Dr. Kirokupolo uh, will be talking about Challenges for next generation meat analogs. Welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, so today I'm going to give you a short lecture about our uh, research in Wageningen and specifically in the uh, Department of Food Process Engineering. We are working on uh, developing uh, um, high moisture extruded uh, meat analogs, but Mostly we are trying to understand how the biopolymers that are used in these applications behave and how we can actually adjust the ingredient production processes to achieve the maximum out of it. I will start my presentation with my take home message. Uh, so, uh, so far we know that several plant-based uh, ingredients are available on the market and soy is one of the uh, most common uh, ingredients. These ingredients, however, are mostly, once they are produced and refined, are mostly aimed on general application. So you can see isolates and concentrates that can be applied in uh, products like drinks, uh, beverages, uh, meat analogs, um, porridges, etc. But uh, are they actually applied for, uh, can they actually be uh, applied in meat analogs? Um, yes, they can, but uh, usually we need to optimize the uh, uh, meat analog uh, process in such a way based on the ingredients that are available. 
So this made, made us think, can we actually produce secretins specifically uh, targeted in this application? So optimizing the fractionation process to meet the meat analog application requirements. And to do so, we have to identify which functional properties actually of the proteins are important to produce this uh, fibrous, desired fiber structure for these uh, meat analogs. And, to do, to, and uh, our process should also consider uh, to be sustainable and provide nutritional ingredients. What we know currently for the ingredient production uh, uh, processes, as also the previous uh, speaker uh, said, uh, for many uh, plant-based ingredients and on soy specifically, uh, which is a byproduct of uh, the food in, um, the oil uh, production uh, process, um, also many other uh, plant pro plant-based pro proteins are byproducts of another uh, pro uh, product. Uh, these are uh, usually isolated, uh, and the isolation process increases the value, uh, nutritional value, but also the price of the product. In many cases, uh, the industry is focused on increasing the purity of these ingredients. So at the end, you have uh, pure ingredients with um, defined chemical composition that, that are stable products, and they also have uh, a quite broad functionality. So for example, they are quite soluble, or they have desired functionality to be applied in multiple products. And what we actually see is that these pure ingredients are mixed together uh, to produce new uh, uh, plant-based products like meat analogs uh, and to uh, achieve the desired structure. But through this uh, refining process, a big amount of uh, these ingredients is actually uh, turning up to non-food applications, so for example, animal feed. So this made us think, that, do we actually need these really refined ingredients? And is this desirable for meat analogs? But before I go to answer this question, I want to give a short introduction about what a meat analog is. You've probably already heard this from the previous uh, presenters, but meat analogs are products that try to, uh, they are usually based on, on plant uh, ingredients and they try to recreate the nutritional value, but also the aesthetics of meat. So try to mimic uh, the meat texture. Um, usually uh, there are uh, two main, uh, one commercial uh, uh, meat uh, analog uh, production process, which is the extru extrusion, but we also in Wageningen, and uh, we produce uh, the sear cell technology. The extrusion uh, itself can be uh, performed under uh, low moisture conditions or high moisture conditions. When ingredients are treated under low moisture conditions, in fact, what is created is a texturized vegetable protein, which uh, can be hydrated and kneaded into uh, products like a, a beef burger or a beef patty. And with high moisture extrusion, uh, what comes out of an extruder is usually uh, products that look more like uh, chicken chunks or the small pieces of chicken meat. Uh, these products, uh, as already said, are produced under high uh, extrusion temperatures, but they give this and they try to recreate this uh, structure of meat, which is uh, highly desirable. Also in the same line, uh, we have the sear cell technology, which was developed in uh, Wageningen University in uh, my department, the food process engineering. Uh, this technology also tries to mimic whole cut meat. Uh, and in fact, we are really interested in creating this fiber structure and this juiciness of the product. The difference with the extrusion is on the size of the product. The product, uh, is quite bigger than actually what it comes out from an extruder uh, dice. And uh, our, product, our process is considered slightly mild, milder in terms of uh, temperature. And here in the pictures, you can see some of our products that we produced in uh, our lab. And both of them are based on uh, uh, a mixture of soy protein isolate and gluten. And the top one, uh, you can see it uh, once colorants are added, how closer it resembles the meat muscle. So how does this uh, technology actually work? Uh, we start with um, an, uh, 
we start with the powder, the protein powder, which, which uh, is the basis of our recipe. This is hydrated and feed it into uh, our uh, sear cell uh, device. This type of device here is a quad device, so it's a cylinder, uh, which has a cylinder on the inside. Between the two cylinders, we feed the product and the cylinders are uh, heated up and the inner cylinder is rotating. And with this rotation, it creates this uh, desired uh, fibrous uh, structure. So it uh, texturizes our uh, protein. Uh, once we open the device, we see the piece of slab, uh, in fact, that comes out. So you can see here my colleague uh, treating the, taking the slab out of the machine. And uh, you can see how thick and long it can be. So cutting this slab into pieces, in fact, we can uh, create, as my colleagues call it, a vegetable steak. Uh, this is, as, we, as I said, in a normal recipe. So soy protein concentrate and uh, isolate and gluten. We are trying to understand how the ingredients actually behave. And here in this slide, I, I present you an overview of the recent research that has been done in our lab. So we test different ingredients that are uh, available on the market. So we have the soy protein isolate and gluten, as I showed you before. This, uh, this uh, uh, pieces uh, are slightly smaller because they are made in the um, lab scale uh, device that we have. Uh, what we see is that uh, a combination of ingredients usually gives the uh, nice uh, fibrous structure and quite juicy product. You can have either two types of proteins mixed together. You can have either a protein or a carbohydrate mixed together as it's uh, seen here, which is uh, soy protein isolate with pectin. We've also tested other types of protein. So we see also pea protein isolate uh, mixed with gluten that can also form fibers. Of course, they can be slightly different. Um, in uh, later research, we have also seen uh, soy protein isolate mixed with flour containing oil also to form a fiber. But once we look at the really commercial samples, so if we compare soy protein concentrate and soy protein isolate, we see that the isolate itself, it's quite more rubbery and it doesn't form the desirable uh, fiber structure as the protein concentrate. So this uh, made us also look at the uh, meat alternatives that are already on the market. And what we actually see is in general that the uh, production of uh, plant-based uh, meat analogs uh, uses a lot soy protein concentrates. So soy protein concentrates can give us uh, quite uh, um, fibrous uh, structure and, and while soy protein isolate on its own in any device, so in our seal device, but also in extrusion application, it doesn't seem to be a good ingredient. Um, this uh, product is, uh, although soy protein isolate more expensive and more um, concentrating protein, so it can have some uh, nutritional uh, benefits compared to soy protein concentrate. However, this uh, uh, extensive purification procedure that it uh, goes under, uh, it doesn't make it uh, a, des a desired ingredient. So soy protein uh, concentrate and water uh, seem to uh, be uh, the best candidates for this type of products. And these are, also, are only produced by removing uh, oil and some soluble ingredients. Uh, so this uh, come, uh, brings us to a conclusion that less purified ingredients uh, are more uh, suited for meat alternatives. If we look now the, uh, how the fractionation process goes and uh, compare the protein yield and the protein purity, starting from uh, soybean with, uh, with a relatively high for the soybean protein content, but trying to uh, make it even more um, enriched in protein, just by milling or defatting, we get uh, defatted soy flour, which uh, already on its own has a, a protein purity around 40%. Uh, percent. If we want to go further into the fractionation process by adding um, a washing step with, as the previous presenter said, with uh, uh, 
alcohol solution, uh, we see that uh, we create protein concentrates where the protein purity is increased uh, around 65%, but immediately the protein yield uh, drops. And the more intensive the fractionation steps go, the more we can increase the protein purity, reaching up to 90%. But all in all, at this last process, we lose about 50% of the actual protein. And this uh, usually goes to non-food applications, so we cannot recover this. So this actually made us uh, think, how can we uh, create functional fractions instead of isolates or isolated components, for example, and uh, high uh, protein isolate and uh, some carbohydrates that we mix together uh, to create the meat analogs. Instead of really fractionating and mixing in uh, high pure components together to create uh, fraction, uh, functional fractions. In this way, we can take advantage of the, re the richness uh, of, the of the matrix uh, and avoid uh, overprocessing. And in the process, uh, we had as a goal to understand what are the key behaviors of ingredients that we need for meat analogs. And based on this, suggest a reverse engineering approach on how to sort of reconsider the fractionation process to create ingredients for our application. Uh, to start, we compared, we first saw the traditional fractionation process uh, to create a protein isolate. And what is the reasoning behind the selected steps uh, that are there? So we start with the soybeans. Uh, we mill the soybeans, defat them to remove the oil, which is actually the main product, as I said, of the soybeans. Afterwards, uh, an alkaline solubilization step uh, is uh, introduced. This, is, this increases the solubility of the protein, disentangles the protein from the other components, and in that way, we can remove any insoluble carbohydrates. After the solubilization step, we have an acid precipitation step where the uh, pH is adjusted close to the pi of the soy protein. So we can actually separate a significant fraction of the proteins. After the, uh, in this step also, we remove any soluble carbohydrates. And after this step, we can uh, wash uh, our product and neutralize it in a neutral pH. And this neutralization step actually helps the, uh, significantly the functionality of the protein. And at pH 7, the solubility of the protein in general is uh, relatively high. So that's how uh, a protein isolate is uh, recovered. Uh, in our process now, we, we uh, suggest in an aqueous fractionation process where actually the defatting step, with, uh, which is usually uh, with organic solvent, doesn't take place. And uh, we remove the excessive washing steps uh, because, in fact, we don't want to purify our ingredients so much that they don't work uh, for our application. As I showed you before, so, so for the soy protein isolate. Um, so we uh, created, in fact, a mild fractionated soy protein, uh, which eventually had a protein content of 75% with an index uh, of a conver conversion factor of uh, 5.7. We see also some oil still remaining in the, in the sample, although we didn't use any organic solvents. However, a significant amount of oil was removed, so this the defatting process can also be considered successful. Um, as, as I said, the enrichment uh, is quite high, but we still have some carbohydrates remaining in our fi fraction, which are beneficial. We um, tested this product in our Circel uh, uh, equipment, and we compared this product with a protein concentrate and a uh, soy protein isolate. We mix our product with uh, full fat flour to actually recreate the composition of the soy protein concentrate, which we knew that was a successful uh, ingredient. But in fact, uh, after the structuring in, the, in our sear cell uh, device, we didn't see any fibers. Although the sample was quite uh, juicy, no fibers were uh, seen. 
Uh, and uh, what we decided to do is to actually toast our ingredients. So we uh, applied a heating step after the fractionation and uh, we use this material uh, uh, and we show that fibers started to appear. So in fact, even if you have the exactly the same composition, this doesn't um, guarantee that the product will work. But we see with uh, small uh, treatment steps, like a post-treatment uh, by heating, for example, you can uh, rec create uh, such functionality that can um, uh, give us yield some uh, desired, uh, desired uh, fibers. Already by mixing the ingredients with water, uh, we could see some differences. So you can see the soy protein isolate, how it behaves, the concentrate, the non toast it, it was more like a, a gooey dough instead of a crumbly dough, but the toasted one resembled very well the soy protein concentrate. Um, the way uh, that the product sort of uh, holds water or if it can be solubilized uh, affects these uh, properties. And that's why we tested the water holding capacity and the nitrogen solubility index. So to test how much protein is actually solubilized. And we see that the successful uh, samples for uh, creating this fiber structure, so uh, sample number two and sample number four, uh, had a sort of mean intermediate water holding capacity, intermediate to high, uh, and uh, intermediate uh, nitrogen solubility index, or intermediate uh, protein solubility, while the non toasted uh, couldn't hold so much water. So maybe that's also what we see in the structure here. Um, from this research, we concluded that uh, uh, distinct fiber structures could obtain when the soy protein isolate was thermally heated at 150 degrees. And uh, together with uh, the combination of native flour uh, showed that um, not so refined fractions could, uh, could yield this desirable uh, uh, fibrousness. This means that maybe we should focus on not completely purifying our ingredients um, because also our functionalities are not the classical functionality. So we are not looking also for high soluble products, for example. By avoiding intensified extraction steps, we can also make our product more, more sustainable and keep inside the material ingredients that could be beneficial. And post-treatment steps can be a way to actually modify the ingredients to the desirable, uh, for example, uh, water holding capacity and solubility. So uh, by heating, we can increase the water holding capacity and reduce the solubility in that extent um, that it creates a really functional ingredient. And this is, research is still going on and we are still working on understanding how the properties of the, of the ingredients behave. And we designed different uh, fractionation process and uh, dedicated formic analogs. So from the aqueous uh, fractionation process that it's already, uh, already uh, introduced, we also thought about changing some steps. So going to even a simpler fractionation process by removing, for example, the acid precipitation step or even removing the alkaline solubilization step. And what we actually observed is that the composition was significantly different. So we have still enrichment on the protein, but by removing the acid precipitation step, uh, the enrichment is, is lower, so it's closer to a protein concentrate. But in this uh, fraction, uh, still a significant uh, portion of soluble carbohydrates remain with, together with the protein. While in the last uh, line, the yellow line, um, while we have a bit lower um, protein enrichment, we have significantly higher oil enrichment and insoluble carbohydrates still remain in the fraction. So by selecting the right uh, extraction steps, we can modify significantly the, uh, proper, the composition of our ingredients. 
we also went uh, one step further. So only not only modifying the composition, but uh, modifying the functionality and the nutritional quality. And in fact, this can uh, with this we did by just replacing the sodium uh, hydroxide in the in the fractionation process uh, by calcium uh, hydroxide. In this way, or our goal was to actually um, uh, produce high calcium, low sodium, soy protein ingredients. Uh, and by doing this change between calcium, uh, sodium hydroxide and calcium hydroxide, we actually also saw a significant difference in the functionality. And why are we interested in, really in uh, replacing sodium with calcium? So calcium on its own, um, it's a nutritional component for the human body. Uh, it helps on the strengthening the bones, the human bones, bones. But also, um, we see that with the changing from the um, animal-centric diet to a plant-forward diet, uh, uh, maybe a significant amount of population will have will experience some calcium deficiency. So, uh, enriching the products with calcium can be beneficial. On the other hand, so for sodium. We see that the, especially the Western diet, uh, uh, overconsumption of sodium is observed. And we know that sodium is added also as a flavorant, but also it has some technical functionality. And that's the reason that you see it in many products. But we also understand that sodium is introduced in the ingredients, the plant based ingredients, through the fractionation process. So, in fact, through this uh, neutralization, uh, sorry alkaline um, solubilization step and neutralization step, you add actually extra sodium in your fraction. Uh, here I have a, a comparison between a, a piece of meat. So uh, the content of sodium in a piece of meat uh, for 100 grams of meat unmarinated without any additional um, uh, taste uh, components, you have approximately 100 milligrams of sodium. Uh, while a corresponding piece of meat, like a vegetarian steak, just using uh, soy protein isolate, um, we are talking about a high moisture uh, content product where you only need 30 grams of soy protein isolate to create this structure. You get about three times more sodium. So you already see that by using these ingredients, you add extra sodium in your diet. So we looked at the same fractionation uh, procedure by uh, only um, changing uh, the sodium um, hydroxide in the solubilization step or in the neutralization step with uh, calcium hydroxide or in both steps with calcium hydroxide. What we actually observed is that the sodium content, when the, the so, uh, calcium hydroxide was used in the neutralization step, the sodium content was significantly lower, which is something that we are interested in, and the calcium content was enriched. But at the same time, this enriched enrichment in calcium caused some uh, 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 changes in the functionality of this uh, soy protein uh, isolate. And this can be seen uh, in this graph. Uh, so, in fact, I uh, plotted here the water holding capacity, so how much water the ingredients can uh, uh, take up, uh, and also the solubility. So, uh, the original fraction closer to the soy protein isolate, where uh, sodium is used in the alkaline step and the uh, neutralization step, has a really high uh, solubility. Uh, while, while we increase the calcium content, we see that the solubility of the ingredients start to increase significantly, and especially where the, when the calcium hydroxide was used in the neutralization step. So we can, uh, by changing the calcium content in the product, we can already modify the um, uh, solubility, uh, protein solubility of our ingredient. In these ingredients now that have a really high uh, solubility index, if we apply a toasting step or another heating step, we see that this uh, actually increases the water holding capacity. 
and also decreases the solubility. So the same can happen uh, in any ingredients with a heating step. And if we look at the desired properties for the meat analogs, as I said from our first, um, the first part of uh, my presentation, uh, we see that uh, medium uh, solubility, uh, it's more desired for this application, but also uh, medium to high uh, water holding capacity, uh, it's also a plus, but not too high as we had for the soy protein isolate, the commercial sample. So we, uh, by creating these functionality maps, we try to get insights about which uh, properties are more relevant for our application. And this uh, brings me uh, to my final slide, which is again a uh, take home message. Um, we are researching the key functionalities of the proteins and we, uh, for the, uh, to dedicate it for fiber structure formation for meat analogs, uh, processed in extru extrusion process or the sear cell technology. And we see that the functionalities that are desired are quite different of the what of the commercial products that uh, are available now. So, for example, we are not looking for really high soluble fractions. Um, we've uh, uh, I've shown in my presentation, but that by changing the fractionation process, we can improve the nutritional quality. So we can enrich, uh, for example, the fractions with calcium, or we can even reduce the sodium content. And by uh, changing the processing, uh, we can uh, improve the functionality, uh, or I would say tailor the functionality towards uh, our desired uh, range. And at the same time, by removing any excess uh, steps, we can uh, also play a role on sustainability. Uh, for example, uh, removing any uh, excessive washing steps that are dedicated for purifying the ingredients, which we actually don't need. By putting together all this information, we can uh, look, uh, we can focus on creating a reverse engineering approach where we can uh, design our fractionation process so that the ingredients produced can fit to our application. And with this, I conclude my presentation. Uh, this is my contact details and I'm uh, available for any questions and you can contact me uh, through my email. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kira Kopolo, for your excellent presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, so uh, without further ado, I think we'll move uh, straight into the panel discussion. Uh, then the audience will get a chance to ask questions to uh, Dr. Kira Kopolo, but also to the other speakers um, at the presentation, at the session. Uh, so I'll briefly uh, recap uh, the members of the panel, uh, the presenters for this session, uh, starting from uh, Dr. Um, so, um, Stacy uh, Dobson and uh, Dr. Alejandro Marangoni, who uh, is not able to join us now, but Stacy is here. Um, and we also have uh, Michelle Brown, Dr. Brown, and uh, Dr. Kishan Liu, and Dr. Uh, Constantina Kirokuplo. All right, so I will start with uh, questions for Dr. Liu um, and then uh, Dr. Kirokuplo, okay? Uh, so you have a question from the audience, Dr. Liu. Uh, when you say the solubility is reduced for the soy. Uh, protein product, does this mean that the taste is grainy? 
solubility. So, so we use that the uh, starter material to will be denatured. So the protein will be denatured in the product. So solubility of protein is very low. Um, that there's nothing to do with, you talk about green, right? Bini, you talk about green or you talk about flavor? What, what the question? Can, can you? Uh, the, the question is, when you say the solubility is reduced, does it mean that the taste is grainy? Oh, grainy. Oh, yes. Okay. I see. I see. Oh, grainy. Um, well, this is a depend on not a, for a beverage. So this is not for a beverage. So that mean the grainy and the solubility are not a, totally related because grainy relate to particle size of products. So when we, after this uh, uh, drying, we reduce the particle size and then incorporate into select or bakery. They are similar particle size to as other ingredients. So they are, I don't think they will cause a grainy uh, into beer. It's a good question. Uh, but the protein solubility, See, when doing this bakery or the product, they are, their protein solubility is reduced anyway. So it, so I don't think they affect the grainy te texture. So okay. it depends on particle size. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Liu. Uh, um, so the, the next question is for Dr. Kirakopoulou. Uh, what is the fate of oil in the alkaline solubilization of full fat soy? Yeah, that's a really good question. So by using uh, the uh, immediately from the, the from the full fat uh, flour the um, alkaline solution, in fact the oil comes out in a creamy layer. So and in that layer uh, it's uh, probably in the form of oil bodies. So we see um, a potential for this material to be used as an emulsifier immediately as uh, condensed and be used as a sort of vegan mayonnaise. Uh, but also if we want to really separate the oil, it's possible to break these oil bodies and separate the oil um, yeah, by intensive centrifugation. Uh, probably you can uh, also um, take out the oil. But uh, for our product, um, as already said in the previous presentation, the addition of oil in the meat analogs is really difficult. They tend to, the oil tends to separate. So by using ingredients that already in the natural structure, they contain part of the oil, we consider that really important. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much, Constantina. Um, so I have um, a question uh, for the panel, but this uh, for the general panel. Uh, so maybe if you have the expertise, you could uh, answer. Um, what what is the the future, you know, in terms of uh, plant protein processing? Um, because from the presentations, you see that sometimes when you apply processing, you compromise some functionality. Uh, so what do you see as the future in terms of minimal processing? to plant-based proteins that can be used to achieve maximum functional and uh, health benefits in food products. So, um, so any, any one of you can, uh, oh. can answer if you will, if you will. I can take that first. That's no problem. If you don't mind, um, you know, the, Thank you for the question. And uh, your phrasing it was, you know, talking about processing. And I think a point that I conveyed within my talk was processing doesn't always take away nutrients, right? Sometimes it concentrates or isolates them more, makes them more digestible, more readily available. Um, so we have to be mindful in the processing decisions that we make uh, to optimize the nutrients. And we heard a lot of different strategies uh, throughout the course of, of this session for doing so. Um, there are many other strategies that are currently in place um, that we didn't get to touch on. Um, and, and, and this is going to be an exciting area going forward um, of uh, you know, how can we take the plants that we are, that are, that the, the, the producers, the farmers are, have become so good at, at uh, growing and harvesting and take that forward to help to feed our growing global population um, and supply that essential nutrient protein. And since I come from the nutrition perspective, you know, you're talking about the future state, I, I think it's exciting as we, uh, 
continue to learn more about this uh, source, soy that's been in the food supply for so long, we're still learning uh, of the health effects that it may have in, in terms of some of the conditions that we face currently in terms of uh, you know uh, threats to our health. Um, the challenges, the nutrition challenges, the health challenges that we face today are different than those we, that we faced, say, 50 years ago. Um, we were doing research on soy back then, but for different outcomes. So there's, there's still a lot of work to be done. So I'll, I will pause there and let someone else. Uh... Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else wants to add to that because we're now receiving uh, some more questions. Um, so maybe I can uh, pose more questions and maybe you can jump in if you have comments on this question, you can add it then, okay? Uh, so this next question is also for uh, all of you. Uh, so besides soy, are there other plant proteins that can be economically used to mimic animal-based uh, proteins. So maybe Stacy can uh, start. Yeah. Uh, this. I can jump in on that. Um, I think that soy has been you is kind of been existing as that main protein for a while. Um, personally speaking for the project that I've been working on, we've actually chosen to use pea as our main source, as our main uh, protein source, because it is offering um, that alternative protein other than soy as um, depending on the environment uh, people are, do try to steer away from it sometimes but it does have great structural properties soy protein does um, but I think in the future we'll see other bean proteins or other legume proteins being looked into further like chickpea lentil uh, and understanding their functionality more as uh, we try to determine what all these other types of uh, Kind of plant proteins can do for us. Maybe since uh, you just addressed uh, this question, there was another question specifically for you, Stacy. So maybe uh, you sure. can continue. It says, uh, "Can prolamine chelate uh, minerals like iron?" Um, to be honest, I haven't looked into it. There may be some possibilities. It's an incredibly hydrophobic protein in the sense that. It, uh, it doesn't, when you mix it with water, just plain, it doesn't dissolve. You have to work with it to get, uh, to get it to make its fibrous uh, component. So I haven't explored using any type of chelating metals, but um, we found that our organic acid worked best for us to get that extendability, but using it in another function, you may be able to uh, use those type of salts. Yeah, so is there any other take on, on this? So I, 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 was, I was thinking that this question is also maybe related to the use of the you know, protein uh, metal chelate as a means of delivering the mineral uh, for mitigating uh, micronutrient deficiency. So looking at it from that perspective, maybe uh, Michelle or Keshan, um, so have you seen any, any uh, examples of uh, using proteins, uh, particularly prolamines, as a mineral chelator for delivery purposes? Mineral is it for, it's about for, for texture or for mineral chelate for this, uh, this kind of protein. What? Well, there is no particular applications here, but uh, from uh, Dr. Braun's presentation, uh, proteins also were presented as also a means of enhancing um, mineral absorption and uh, reducing uh, micronutrient deficiency, like uh, iron or zinc uh, oh. deficiency. So looking at it from that perspective, especially you know, in uh, food product formulations in uh, at-risk populations for micronutrient deficiency, uh, do you see any possibility of you know, using these proteins, uh, prolamines to chelate mineral? I think for Dr. Brown, probably better is a worse for a nutrition area. Maybe Dr. Brown can answer this question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dr. Brown? Right. Um, iron absorption from plant sources uh, can be a challenge. Um, it can't, uh, it's not as optimized from the plant sources as it may be um, in other forms. Um, so when I mentioned the product that was fortified with iron, um, there was, it had a higher, it, it, we have to think about the form of iron that's available as well. We're 
approaching this from the protein side of things in this question, but we also have to think about the form of the iron. Um, and then um, in considering overcoming absorption challenges, um, you know, other uh, anti-nutritionals that may impact absorption, um, a lot of times those minerals are added at a higher level um, to the plant sources to help to overcome those absorption um, you know, drawbacks. Uh, so in the product that I, I demonstrated, there was a higher uh, amount of iron available in that in that product um, at, just to ensure that the iron is um, at, at some at, at some proportion absorbed by the by the consumer okay thank you very much uh, dr Braun. Um, so I have another question here for for everybody um, have other forticans be been added to soy protein slash analog products so I so we already talked about iron now. So, uh, you know, is, are there cases where other forticans are added uh, to some of these uh, texturized protein products? You talk about other ingredients? Uh, other forticans, yes. Oh. Other, you know, uh, compounds for fortification purposes, like uh, vitamins or other minerals um, in, uh, for food fortification. Uh, so are there other cases where other uh, forticans have been added to these products? Um, uh, so in addition to just uh, creating the product functionality, can you also add other forticans? Yeah, uh, I think uh, for this, uh, for middle analog during this extrusion, by extrusion, like uh, talk about high moist extrusion or even at low moist, the, uh, maybe uh, the, during this uh, final products, they probably can add some vitamins. But during this before process, they cannot be added because the temperature, like for vitamin destruction, may be high. So, but after this, uh, it's a post extrusion process. Probably they can add some of this forticant. Uh, I think. Um, I think that for uh, maybe other speaker, maybe you could, because they all deal with kind of products. Uh, they probably can add some more. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Liu. I think uh, Dr. Kira Kupolo, maybe you could weigh in here since you talked about uh, using calcium hydroxide for <laughs> isolation of a protein. Uh, yeah, so sure. maybe it, yeah. Uh, yeah. We can see for these metabolics that are on the market that there is also a trend, especially for the ones that are uh, basically for vegan uh, consumers. There's a trend at, at, um, a trend to fortify them with uh, vitamins and iron uh, just to meet the requirements uh, for people that don't eat, uh, for example, uh, red meat. So that's also a possibility. And in many cases, I would say the combination of proteins that are used, not only in terms of uh, structuring, but also adding additional proteins in the, in the product as um, binders or maybe flavor, uh, flavoring uh, agents or uh, have other functionality, they can also um, say, uh, add uh, amino acids that uh, uh, are missing. So to make the amino acid balanced, uh, yeah, the product balanced in amino acids. Okay, thank you. Uh, so speaking about adding amino acids. And oh, sorry, go ahead, um, show. I was just going to add, uh, you know, we heard a lot about uh, calcium, different salts that can be used. Potassium is another commonly used salt in the processing. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's in the process, it can be added. But in the, I believe the question was, what other forti you know, fortifying nutrients can be present? And a great example we can look to is infant formula. Um, so, you know, that's, that, that's a foundational product that's available that's you know the only plant source that has been demonstrated yet to be viable within that the delivery system is soy soy based infant formula um, where it meets the nutrient needs macronutrient needs as well as micronutrient needs um, and and a full complement of of vitamins and minerals and other key nutrients uh, to help to uh, make that product uh, as close to breast milk as possible and definitely analogous to cow's milk formula, which has been demonstrated in, in study. So, um, you know, it begins from that infant formula uh, format, but uh, certainly a variety of vitamins and minerals can be added um, to, to these products. And, and the ready-to-use therapeutic food that I mentioned also had a, a matching vitamin mineral premix um, similar to the, the peanut and, and 
cow's milk uh, based product, which also have vitamins and minerals added. Um, so uh, sorry, over to your, your next question. Just wanted to add that point. All right, thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, so, so this next question is specifically for uh, Dr. Kira Kupolo, um about uh, the, uh, the full fat uh, soy protein uh, isolation. So the question is about uh, the oxidative stability of this product. So um, what do you think in a, for the products that have high uh, oil content, the protein isolates have or concentrates that have high oil, uh, protein, oil content, um, wouldn't there be issues of uh, uh, oil oxidation, lipid oxidation uh, during uh, prolonged storage? So we've seen that the state in which the oil is stored. So if it's in the original oil bodies, it's still protected. So this doesn't um, show any um, oil oxidation. But once you have intensive processing and you break these oil bodies and the oil remains in the sample, we have, uh, we didn't test it exactly, but we have uh, evidence with some smell, let's say coming out of samples that have been stored for a longer time that show this oxidation. But um, yeah, this is ongoing research and we want to see how stable these uh, products are uh, longer uh, as uh, food ingredients that you store uh, for a longer period of time. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, so I have another question, maybe two more questions, uh, but one is uh, for everybody. I just wanna get a perspective uh, in terms of uh, uh, cultural sustainability, you know, um, since uh, we're trying to develop uh, uh, protein-based products that, that's acceptable across different populations in the world. Um, now, what do you think about uh, the type of processing that you need to do to achieve a product that has um, a taste and a texture and uh, other uh, properties that the consumer would accept because you're trying to use it, especially for texturized uh, proteins for meat analog applications. Uh, so how do you achieve a product that is culturally acceptable to the consumer in terms of uh, uh, taste and texture? I can take uh, a first stab at that if, oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I think uh, this is, uh, is durable, but depending on the cost. I mean, everything is kind of talk about how, what kind of process, what kind of equipment they use. So also the local uh, taste of flavor, the, 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 all this uh, is kind of uh, during these product development stages. So they are durable, but depend on what the cost of what product can they develop, right? What the kind of ingredients, uh, let's say you want to make a meat out of what the kind of the uh, textures, protein product you want to use as a starting material, or even during initial selection stages, like uh, during the high moist protein, you can start with what kind of uh, raw material. So there are many, many choices in terms of the, uh, the ingredient selection the uh, the processing equipment and if after uh, uh, processing also what kind of like uh, flavoring uh, the formulations uh, all this kind of all work together so is there no single answer on this one it's durable but depend on uh, what the cost you want you can absorb okay thank you question Michelle you were uh, going to add your perspective. Sure. Uh, you know, just to build on that, um, you know, it's, it's important to think about the quantity or the dose, the amount of protein that you want to deliver in that final product. Um, you know, and, and it comes down to the too much of a good thing can deliver off notes or off flavor. So when we go to higher doses of any protein, then those characteristic off notes come through. For soy, it's beanie. Um, pea has its own off notes. Um, Dairy has its own off notes. It's barn, barnyard is how it's characterized. Um, and so sometimes blending proteins can help to um, optimize or, or um, still reach those target doses um, with minimizing the off notes that come from just one protein source. But but the question was about how these protein sources can, can be a part of traditional diets. And I think it's first important to acknowledge that tastes are very regional. So that beanie flavor is very much preferred in, in regions such as uh, Asia Pacific. Um, those are not as necessarily 
as seen as off notes as much as they are in other parts of the world um, where, and so uh, whether it's desired for a savory flavor or a sweet flavor um, that gets added to uh, a finished product, you know, again, it's very regional specific. And, and when we do sensory work, um, we don't uh, extrapolate what we learn in one country or one region to the rest of the globe. Instead, we uh, do those studies appropriately in, in the regions that have the, the users, the tasters, um, uh, that will receive the product in, in the end. Um, so it's, it's important to, to take those uh, elements into consideration. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Uh, so um, Constantina and Stacy, do you have uh, perspectives to add? Um, I can touch on it just briefly. I think um, I think you had mentioned about the cost involved in these productions, and um, as we've seen, uh, uh, some with uh, there's the shear cell, it can create great fibers and extrusion can create great fibers, but sometimes those means aren't as feasible in parts of the world as they are in others. So um, I think there needs to be more exploration and methods that can be done, um, kind of without these type of equipment. Um, that's what I've been working on as I think making this product that doesn't involve um, all this uh, extensive equipment kind of makes it more adaptable in places that can't afford it. And also um, trying to explore the elements of adding different types of protein in it. So you can kind of customize it based on which region is growing um, certain types of uh, plant-based proteins and trying to develop the product uh, for what they have. So kind of creating a system that can be applied. I think uh, as the plant-based industry continues to grow, it's definitely something that um, I can see it building into. Okay, thank you, Stacy And Constantina, if you have a perspective, I would like you to combine it with these specific questions target, uh, targeted to you. It says, uh, uh, what is the advantage of your process over high moisture extrusion? Uh, for your protein isolation. Yeah. So for the previous question, I would also say to really consider um, not only the protein enrichment that we want to achieve, like to not over process the ingredients. And we can also see um, that going to more traditional methods like fermentation, you can achieve some enrichment and in parallel some removal of anti-nutritional anti -nutritional factors, which can be beneficial. And it can also improve the flavor for the countries that uh, cannot accept this beanie flavor for the product. So I think there are many uh, ways to really uh, yeah, modify the ingredients without over-processing. And these ingredients can be incorporated in the, uh, yeah, in the diets of the different people. And for the second question, um, so the Searcell technology is developed, uh, it's sort of in parallel with the extrusion process. Uh, the difference is it's a batch process. Uh, and in fact, uh, we don't have so much mechanical energy given into the system, but we still can achieve really fiber structure. And the system that we have, this quad system, the cylinder in a cylinder can allow us the uh, development of really bigger pieces of uh, product. So instead of uh, being limited, uh, like in extrusion, in the dye uh, morphology, how the product comes out of the extrude, extruder, our product, uh, it sort of takes the shape of the cylinder and it's uh, much bigger in, in size. And so far, the ingredients that we use seem to uh, behave, uh, let's say, form fibers in, the, in temperatures slightly lower than the extrusion process. And we are working in even further to reducing this high, uh, the need for high temperature. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Constantina. And uh, this question uh, brings us to the end of the, the panel discussion. And uh, before we close, I would like to take another uh, moment to thank you, uh, the speakers, uh, Dr. Liu, Dr. Braun, Dr. Clara Kuplo, and uh, Stacey Dobson. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent presentations um, on uh, innovations in plant protein uh, processing. Um, uh, so this has been a very uh, wonderful uh, connection between uh, scientific, uh, uh, fundamental scientific research 
and uh, consumer targeted uh, applications in enhancing uh, functionality and quality. Uh, so uh, from these presentations, I see a very bright future in um, you know, uh, translating uh, proteins from plant-based food, uh, especially soybean, uh, but other legumes and cereals as well, uh, into value-added uh, applications. And uh, it's a pleasure that uh, um, uh, you have uh, presented uh, your perspectives and your uh, innovative research in this direction. I would also like to thank the audience uh, from wherever you have joined us. Uh, thank you very much for participating in the Soybean 360 Symposium. And, uh, and uh, I hope uh, you were also able to join the rest of the three days uh, of this symposium. Uh, thank you very much and bye-bye.